one Sunday a month that we're not doing children's church, and today is that day. Everybody else, or everybody, <laughs> open your Bibles to 1 Peter. We're going to continue our study in 1 Peter. We've took a, taken a break uh, over the holidays and, and uh, looking at some Christmas themes, <clears throat> and then the New Year's, uh, um, New Year's message going into the New Year, so we're getting back to, uh, to 1 Peter. So uh, let me ask you this, this question. <clears throat> um, have you ever uh, thought that in, you get in, in, uh, in situations many times and, and we think we can just sort of work things out on our own? You know, we really don't necessarily depend on the Lord. We just sort of think, well, I can, I can handle this. I got it, Lord. You ever feel like that? Well, we don't want to admit that, but sometimes we do that. Amen? Well, I don't often, in fact, I hardly ever listen to Joel Osteen anymore. I used to. I'd listen to Joel and see if I could get a joke from, from Joe. <laughs> and uh, from Joel Osteen, and, and uh, he got where I, you know, I pretty much knew all the ones that he was telling. And so this morning, I thought, you know what, I'm going to turn it over <laughs> and pick up old Joel, see if he's got a fresh joke. Well, he did. <laughs> and it uh, sort of goes along with, with, uh, with that theme a little bit. Uh, it seems this, uh, this minister was going to marry this couple, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the night of the, of the, of the uh, rehearsal, uh, the the uh, groom got the minister off the side, and he said, uh, "He said, sir, he said, in the ceremony tomorrow, he said, I would really, really appreciate it if you would leave out of uh, a lot of that stuff about me loving my wife and like Christ loved the church and all that, all that sort of thing. Could could you just leave a lot of that out? And make it just real simple. Don't mention any of that stuff." <clears throat> and he slipped him a hundred dollar bill, and so the the minister just stuck that hundred dollar bill in his pocket. Well, anyway, uh, the next day, of course, the wedding ceremony, and so uh, they start their vows, and, and he turns to the, to the groom, and he said, uh, do you promise to worship your wife? He said, do you promise to bring her meals in bed? And he went on and on and on, and he really said it kind of sheepy. He said, I do. And, and then he stepped up closer to the minister he said, I thought we had a deal. He said, we did, but your wife had a better one. <laughs> and he gave him his $100 back. <laughs> well, sometimes we do think that we can sort of get ourselves out of situations or set, us, set ourselves up for a win-win situation sometimes. Uh, but in, the, in this letter of 1 Peter, uh, Peter is, uh, is known in, in the Bible as, as being uh, uh, the apostle to the... Uh, uh, to the uh, Jewish people, to the Hebrews, and, and of course Paul to the Gentiles. And so during this period of time, there was a dispersion of, with the uh, Nero persecution. Christians were being dispersed. And in the first chapter uh, there, uh, Peter talks about some of those colonies, some of those provinces where some of these people were going to. And so Peter is writing them uh, these letters and trying to encourage them in the situation that they're in. Now, I t I've entitled this message today, uh, Christian living in a pagan society. <clears throat> and so uh, sometimes, going back to original what I said, sometimes we think we can get along with this society if we just do things and we don't realize the Lord has given us a way to live in the non-Christian society. Amen? Because, folks, listen, I know that America is known as being a Christian nation, and, uh, but we don't act like it most of the time. And so the Lord can help us if we will allow him to, uh, through his word, to live in this kind of society uh, that we live in, and he can still receive honor and glory and praise. Now, I'm going to uh, read these verses, verses 11 uh, through, uh, through 20, and then we will uh, back up and talk about some of these things. <clears throat> Peter writes, and he says, Beloved, he says, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from, fresh, from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable, among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. Verse 15 says, For this is the will of God that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. 
as free, yet <clears throat> not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, <clears throat> not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable uh, if because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For that which, for what credit is it when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. So I want us to look, first of all, in that, in that uh, first verse, and, uh, and we've, we've titled that first verse, Our War. And we've gone through some uh, scripture before and, and realizing that as we are in this life, once we trust Jesus as our personal Savior, uh, we have His new nature living within us. The Holy Spirit indwells our lives. But we still, that, we still have that old nature that we're going to have to contend with until the Lord calls us home. And so this, this old nature, that is the nature that Satan and his demons appeal to, the appetites of that old nature. Now look what he says here. First of all, in this verse, uh, look at, look at uh, Peter's plea. And he calls these people he's writing to. He, the word here is beloved. Sometimes it's, it's pronounced beloved. So what he's saying, he loves these people. He's writing to these people because he really does love them. And Peter learned a good message about love, didn't he? When, when he was uh, uh, with Jesus at the Sea of Tiberias after the resurrection, after Jesus appeared to those apostles, and he was, he was sitting there uh, with, with Peter, and, and he asked Peter, if you love me, and, uh, and Peter would answer him, uh, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he'd say, feed my lambs or feed my sheep. And two different times as he, uh, as he gave Peter that, that, that challenge, uh, the Greek word for, for, uh, uh, for uh, supreme love, the love that God has given to us and the love that we ought to be showing each other is agape or agapeo. And so he would ask Peter, do you agape me? And Peter would say, I phileo you, which really is more humanly speaking. And so he finally, so Peter knew what it was, finally brought him to where he needed to be, but Peter knew what it was to have this agape old love, and this is what he has for these people. He really loves these people. So he says, beloved, I beg you, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims. And so that's, that's his plea. He says, I'm, I'm begging you. Now, let me ask you this question. You have family members, uh, you have friends, you have people. And you know what, they're, what situation they're into, and, uh, and you'd like to help them out, wouldn't you? There are many times you'd like to help them out, and you'd like to say, I beg you, I beg you, don't do this or do that. Huh? And, and many times we're afraid to offend somebody, aren't we? We're afraid that what you're begging them to do, they don't want to do. <laughs> and you're afraid that what you're begging them not to do, they don't want to quit. And so you, you, we make a plea, and we, we plead, and, and Peter is making his plea to these people. He says, I beg you. But what he, what he does with this, he, he, he tries to let them know and encourage them to understand that they are sojourners. They're pilgrims. And so circumstances are bad. Where they were, circumstances may be bad for us or people that we know. But what we need to realize and what we need to try to help these people realize that we may be giving them a word of encouragement. We, we need to help them realize that we're pilgrims. We're just passing through. Amen? We're just passing through this life. Our citizenship is where? It's in heaven. Once we trust Jesus as Savior, our citizenship is in heaven. I looked for uh, Phyllis and I, uh, this, our, in my second pastor, there was a group of ladies, and you've heard me mention them, before, and I still would like to have one of them, I think doesn't live around this part of the country anymore, but the other four do. And, uh, but anyway, they used to have a, a group. Uh, they called themselves the Rhodes Sisters. Their maiden names was Rhodes, and they've all uh, since been, uh, been married and so forth. Uh, well, not so forth. They've been married. <laughs> and, uh, but a great group, and they sang in that, in that church. And, boy, they really made up the choir. And I looked. I thought we had a cassette tape that had their... Uh, uh, some of their songs and because there's one song I was looking for in particular because I either wanted to play it this morning or have somebody sing it this morning or at least be able to tell you the words this morning. And, but all I, could, all I could really remember is that the, the song was We're Not Home Yet Children. 
We're not home yet, children, so keep your eyes on the Savior. That's all I'm going to give you. <laughs> okay? And, uh, and what's the other one? Uh, this world is not my home. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. That's all I'm going to give you that one. <laughs> okay, but, but the songs amplify what I'm trying to say and what Peter was saying. Hey, you need to listen to what God has for you and realize that it's, it's going to get better someday because you're just sojourners. You're just passing through. You're just pilgrims, okay? So that was his plea. Now, as part of this war in, in this verse, uh, look what he says then in the latter part of that verse. He says, abstain or, or flee from uh, fleshly lust which war against the soul. Now, that is a, that's a military term, and the picture is, a, is, is of, a, of a battle, but it's not hand-to-hand -hand combat, <laughs> okay? That's not the picture that, that is within this verse. When you, uh, when you think about wars and people going to war, uh, there's, uh, there's planning that goes along, that goes along getting ready for battle. There's, there's planning uh, that goes into that, and people are getting their, their battle plans together. Well, it's more that sort of thing. In fact, a, a good picture of this for us would be if we would go back and think about the story uh, in the, that the Bible gives us of Samson and Delilah, okay? Delilah was always conniving, wasn't she? She was trying, she was planning, she, was, she would set up things to try to find out where Samson's strength was. And she was doing all this for his destruction. So that's the kind of picture that you get here, is that the, uh, the, the devil and his demons, they are planning, they're conniving, they know us. Folks, listen, I really believe this. I believe that the demons, now, now Satan, we know that Satan, a lot of people give Satan too much credit. Did you know that? A lot of people, every time something happens, well, the devil made me do it. Flip, <laughs> Flip Wilson, remember him? The devil made me do it. Well, you know what? The devil can't be every place at one time. If we, when we depart from here, folks, we go our separate ways after a while. Uh, we're gonna, some of us will be together. Some of us are going to be separate. We're, gonna, we're going to disperse. Okay? But as we go, and as something maybe happens, you know, something we'd rather not happen and so forth, some of us may say, well, the devil did that. Or the devil made me do that, whatever that situation may be. But I'm here to tell you, more than likely, it wasn't the devil. Because he can only be one place at a time. But he's got millions of demons scattered all over this world. And I think these demons study my life and your life. And so they know about these, these appetites that we have. And so it's a, it's a desire of the, of the devil. And he's trained his demons that they're going to try to, to work on you. And they're going to try to appeal to those appetites that's going to cause you to trip up and be a bad testimony for Jesus. When you get saved, they, Satan can't take away your salvation, he or his demons. But they can sure make you trip up and make a lot of other people not want to trust Jesus as Savior because they watch us trip up and they say, well, I, you know, they're no better than me. They're no different than me. They can't do any better than I can. And so that's all about what he is trying to do uh, in each of our lives. So that is, that is, our, uh, that is our warfare. That's our, it's Peter's plea to them and to us and then our, our fight. Uh, but watch in... Uh, in verses 12 through 14, here we talk about, he talks about our, our Christian walk. Now, verse 12 says, uh, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. A couple things about that phrase right there. First of all, uh, that word Gentiles, when you and I think of the word Gentiles, we think anybody that's not a Jew, <laughs> don't we? We think if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. No matter where you come from, any part of the world, if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. But here, some of, the, some of the translations don't use the word Gentiles. They use the word pagans. Anybody here, your Bible got pagan in it instead of Gentiles? Okay, I know Carrie's does. Okay. Uh, Bethany, I need to know what yours says or, or Phyllis what yours says. It still says Gentiles. Okay. So, they're both, they're both good. <laughs> Amen. Because these people where, he's, where these, this group has moved into, they're Gentile people, but also they're pagans. All right. They're, they're worshiping other gods. And even if you say that you don't believe in God, you're still worshiping a God. And usually, if you say you don't believe in God, you're worshiping you. You become God. And your appetites have become what you want to do. Amen? And so, the, this conduct here, another thing about it, he says uh, in, in that verse 12, 
the word conduct in, that, in the first part of that verse is the same word in the original language as good works. So it's be doing good things, your, your conduct, be doing good things that, that bring honor to the Lord and you as a, as a Christian. <clears throat> but then notice in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, at the end of that verse, he says, let your conduct be honorable among uh, Gentiles or pagans, that when they speak against you as evildoers, it's amazing that people will still speak against us as Christians, they'll still speak of us as being evildoers. Did you know many times that you and I as Christians, we get blamed for some of the things in the world? It's all those Christians. It's all the things that they're doing. That's what's causing this. <clears throat> he says for, uh, he says they may by your good works, your being honorable, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. There's that consummation. Understanding this, that it's going to all come to an end someday. This old world, folks, some, someday it's, it's coming to a, to a rapid end. You know, and I, uh, I was at a service recently. And, uh, you know, some people believe in, in soul sleep. I don't believe in soul sleep. I think when a person dies, he or she, if they're saved, their spirit goes to heaven. I think that's what the Bible teaches. Absent from the body is present with the Lord. If you believe in soul sleep, you're going to have to have a lot of scriptures you've got to explain away. Okay? So I believe that when we depart this life, we immediately, by the way, where I got that, 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 that the guy, the minister was saying, uh, talking about this person was, was in the grave, they're in, a, they're in a, uh, uh, a peaceful state there and so forth, and they're, they're waiting for the resurrection day. Well, that body is waiting for the resurrection day. But the spirit is already with the Lord. Spirit waiting for the day when that spirit and body be brought back together and have a glorified body. Now, after that takes place, the Bible teaches us that there's, there's going to be, a, for us as Christians, there's going to be a, the judgment seat of Christ. Now, we cannot have our salvation taken away from us once we're saved. We're saved, okay? And so we're with the Lord. We'll stand before him, though, and give an account of ourselves. And by the way, he knows, folks. But we'll give an account of ourselves since we become a Christian. And there we'll, we'll have rewards given to us. We'll have, uh, some may be withhold. We'll, we'll, I think from, from that judgment seat, we'll see where our position may be in the, in the uh, millennial kingdom. Okay, so <clears throat> with all of that, what I'm saying is as you go through this life, folks, we're sort of going through a, a life that we're going to have a final exam for someday. <laughs> Okay, a final exam someday that we're going to stand before. So that's that consummation that you see on the outline. It's going to all come to an end someday. And it does matter how we've lived since we've become a Christian. Amen? Well, that wasn't a very hearty amen. amen. Amen? Okay, well, that's good. That's good. <clears throat> okay, so then uh, in verses uh, 13 and 14, uh, Peter talks about uh, the kind of citizens we ought to be. He talks about citizenship. Do you think as Christians we ought to be good citizens? We should. We should be good citizens. He says in verse 13, he says, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors. And he's talked about their ones that, uh, uh, that come and, uh, and sometimes have to bring punishment on people depending upon their crimes. I'm going to read another passage to you because this is very similar to what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 13, beginning with verse 1. He says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. <clears throat> For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Let me read that again. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Punishing people for evil. Do you want to be unafraid of authority, of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister. Boy, that... I, I would imagine there's, a lot, there's an awful lot of people right, right now around this world. If I read this passage, if I get on Fox, well, I'm, if I get on a news channel today and read this passage of Scripture and, uh, and tell people 
that uh, Donald Trump is a minister to this country. There's a lot of people say, no, he's not. He's not my minister. Well, let me go on. <laughs> I think you'll, you'll get what I, my, uh, my drift as we, as we move along. He says, for he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he who is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience. I like in verse 6, he says, for because of this, you also pay taxes. <laughs> oh, we'd like to leave that out. Wouldn't we like to leave that out? For also, you pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Customs to whom customs. Fear to whom fear. And honor to whom honor or respect them. Now, said all that, but I want to say this. We ought to obey the laws of our land. Amen. Regardless, folks, as long as they don't go against God's word, we need to pay taxes. Right? We need to, <laughs> we need to pay our bills. We need to not be gossips out in the community and run people down and run our church down. Amen. All those things make for good church members and also for for good citizens. Now, if it ever comes to the point, though, where we're asked to do something that's against God's word, what should we do? Stay with God's word. We don't do it. If it, if it's, if it contradicts what the Bible says, then we don't have to be obedient to that kind of law. Amen? It's sort of like, and Peter's a, he's an expert on this too, you know, because he and other apostles were told as they were preaching Jesus, they were told, shut up. <laughs> Don't speak anymore in his name. Remember what they said? They said, whether it's right in the sight of God to obey you more than God, you be the judge, but we can't help but speak. Amen? They couldn't shut them up. So, someday, we, we pray this day doesn't happen, but someday, if the law comes down, uh, you, can't, uh, you can't preach anymore. Hmm? You can't say Jesus anymore in, in public and, and all these kinds. Of, what would you do? I think I would walk out on the street corner and say, Hallelujah, praise God, thank you, Jesus. Amen. <laughs> and I don't care who hears it. If I, if, if I would be brought before the whomever and, and punished, I'm ready for that because the Lord's going to take care of me. Amen. Because I know that absent from the body is present with the Lord. That's the final, cons that final consummation. So he expects us to be uh, good citizens. Uh, now, let me, let me look at, uh, let's look at verse, verses 15 through 20 real quickly, <clears throat> and here uh, he talks about God's will. Why? Because he says, for this is the will of God. Now, sometimes we wonder about what God's will is for certain things and for us, etc., don't we? Well, I just don't know if it's the Lord's will for me to do that or not to do that and so forth. Well, anytime you're reading the Bible that it says this is God's will, you need to pay real attention. Amen? So there may be some... some uh, Areas in, in, in each of our lives that we may say, well, that's really tough. But that's sort of a gray area. I have an answer for that. WWJD. Somebody tell me what that means. Yeah. If there's any time in your life that there's a gray area, there's a simple solution to the gray areas. Just ask yourself, what would Jesus do? And that'll take care of it. Amen? Okay. In, in verse 15, here he, he talks about, uh, uh, silencing the foolish. He says, for this is the will of God that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. I told you all this before and I think you all have maybe heard it even before I mentioned it to you. But there are times somebody says, well, I don't, I don't believe in God. <clears throat> and sometimes you, you may really surprise them by saying, well, did you know your name's in the Bible? And they're going to say, no, my name's not in the Bible. I, might, I wouldn't name after anyone in the Bible. Da, 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 da. I'd say, well, yeah, it is because in the Bible it says, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. Amen? <clears throat> so uh, here he talks about putting to silence the ignorance of foolish men. That's those pagans, okay? People that really not worshiping God, maybe not even believe in God. And uh, so here he says that they need to be put to silence. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this. Some are that later on in, uh, in history, uh, world history, there, there's some, there's some uh, uh, passages that talk about uh, how uh, 
there was uh, crimes in this in the areas of these provinces. By the way, that's in the first chapter, first verse. That uh, they attached the word crime with Christians. They were saying Christians did these crimes. Well, indeed, what did what did Nero do? He blamed the Christians for burning Rome. Amen. And so we need to let our lives put to silence. He says now in verse ten. Uh, I'm sorry, in verse 16, I'm still trying to get adjusted to my glasses. These are not my new ones yet. <laughs> okay, by the time I get just about used to how I'm supposed to use these, I'll get my new ones, and I'll start all over again, right? But anyway, in verse 16 here, uh, I, I titled this, Servants That Are Free. Now, realize this, that whenever you and I, whenever we trusted Jesus as our personal Savior, we were made free from living under the law. Okay, now people that are trying to live by the law, it's a thing that they're, they're just forcing themselves to do certain things and not do certain things because they, they feel that their salvation is by works. If you do good, you'll go to heaven. If you do bad, you'll go to hell. You stand before God, you, he's got scales. If the, if the good outweighs the bad, then you're going to heaven. If the bad outweighs the good, you're going to hell. Now that's just not the way it works. Amen. He set us free. He set us free from sin, Satan, and self. We no longer have to serve sin, Satan, and self. But sometimes people take that the wrong way. Look what he says. He says, as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants. Let me, let me put that in 21st century vernacular. Somebody may say, well, I'm saved. I can just do what I want to do. If I want to go out and just get drunk every night, I want to get on drugs, I want to go do this, I want to do that, go, uh, do that, that I, then everything is fine because I know I'm saved. I know a guy right now. And uh, this guy, he claims to be a Christian, and uh, I think he, he claims that he got saved after he came home from Vietnam because he talks about he's so thankful that he didn't get killed in Vietnam before he became a Christian. But... He says, I know I'm saved, I know I'm saved, and yet his language turns the sky blue. And he, and he stopped going to church years and years ago. You know, if, you, if a person says he or she's saved and they stop going to church altogether, I have to wonder. Don't you? Now, I know sometimes people are providentially hindered, and that happens. We can't, we can't help that. But I think as long as we can go, I think that we need to be going to church. When I stood with Phyllis at that General Baptist Church, Eight miles from here <laughs> in Chaffee, 52, a little over 52 years ago. When we left that day in my 57 Ford convertible, yes, uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't tell Phyllis that, okay, I'll, I'll see you once in a while. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll drop in on Christmas and, and maybe, maybe hang around for New Year's or come back. I'll see you at Easter and so forth. Uh, so I, but I want you to know I really love you. What would she say? She'd say, we could probably go ahead and get this annulled right now. <laughs> Amen? Okay, so don't use this freedom that we have as, as, a, as a, a way to do what we want to do and say that it's all right. Uh, folks, if we're really saved, we do what he wants us to do. Amen? Whenever we get saved, he changes our want-tos. <clears throat> okay, then uh, watch in... in uh, 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 verses uh, uh, 18 through 20 here. Uh, well, let me back up to verse 17. In verse 17, he says, Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Now, hear what he says. Honor all people. This, in, in the original language, it means high regard for humanity. And folks, listen. And human personality. I believe that goes... To the, to the ones that haven't been born yet, to the ones that some people think they ought to go ahead and euthanize because they can't do the world any good anymore. We need to honor them. Amen? We need to honor all people, period. <clears throat> then, and Peter gets this one right again, he says, love the brotherhood. He, remember, he knows now. Agape, <laughs> agape all the brotherhood. Love the brotherhood. Listen, if we can't love people in church, who in the world are we going to love? If we can't love our brothers and sisters in Christ and really look beyond their faults, because guess what? Pardon, pardon my grammar. They ain't, they ain't a one of us here that's perfect. Hello? 
And all of us are going to make a mistake once in a while. I mean, I told people all the time, probably if you followed me around 24-7, you'd probably get mad at me once in a while because you'd find out I'm not perfect. There's only one person, only one person that ever lived on planet Earth that was perfect, and that was Jesus. He's the only one that did need a Savior because he was the Savior and is the Savior. But all the rest of us need a Savior because we've sinned and come short of the glory of God. But look at, at this being faithful. He says, he says, servants, be submissive to your masters. Uh-oh. <laughs> Everybody's got a boss. Amen. Come on now. Even when you retire, you've still got a boss. Mine's sitting right back there. One, two, three, four pews back. <laughs> My son, he always tickles me to death. I will usually wait till I get off the phone and then I, then I laugh about it with Phyllis. Because we'll be talking about doing something and basically, he says, I'll have to get back with you on that. You know what he's going to do? He's going to go ask his wife. <laughs> he's going to ask. Them. Now, I don't, when Peter's talking about there, listen, now, I don't really think <laughs> that he's telling the wives that you, no, he gives a scripture on that too. He says, wives, be submissive to your own husband as unto the Lord. Amen? Come on now. But he says, husbands, love your wives, wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So sacrifice for her. And she'll be submissive to you. That's pretty simple, amen? But that's what the Bible teaches. But in, in working, uh, and, and boy, in the New Testament, there's all kinds of, of uh, scripture on it, that we should be submissive to our masters or people that we're working for. If, you don't, if you're not, if you're not uh, honorable, and if you don't listen to people you work for, guess what? You're going to join that 3.9% <laughs> that's unemployed. Amen? And, they, and they'd be justified for letting you go if, you don't, if you're not submissive to them. Hello? Okay. <clears throat> Servants, be submissive to your own masters with all fear. Now, does that mean, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No. That means you respect them. Amen. They've got authority over you, so you need to respect them. Not only... Uh, uh, to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. It's very easy to be nice. Somebody comes by and says, oh, you're just doing a tremendous job. We really love what you're doing here. Just keep up the good work. Hey, that's cool, amen? <laughs> I'm submissive to that, man. That's, that's great. But what if somebody comes up to you and they say something like this? Well, you know... Uh, in fact, I had this. Let me just mention this just real briefly. I had a similar thing happen to me. Well, probably all of us had maybe many times, but one stands out in my mind. I remember one place that I, that I worked, and one of the owners came to me, and he said, uh, you've really had a good year. You've done really, really well. But you ought to double that next year. <laughs> what did I feel like saying? Well, you can catch me on the flip-flop. I'm out of here. <laughs> if, I did a good, if I did a good job last year, you know, I just hope I could do that good this year, right? So, by the way, this goes two ways. Masters ought to respect people that are working for them as well, amen? And Paul talks about that in, in other uh, parts. Okay, he says, uh, uh, but good and gentle, but also to people that are harsh. But he says, for this is commendable if because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongdoing. Our conscience is clear before God. We know that we're going to suffer wrongdoing, but we're trusting uh, in him. He says, for what credit is it when you are beaten for your faults? You take it patiently. Why? Because we know we deserve it. And, and when he talks about this, maybe they did more of that back then. We don't have too many people getting beaten for doing bad jobs today, do we? Maybe getting beaten down verbally, but not beaten literally. <clears throat> okay? He says, but... He says, you take that patiently. Why? Because you need it. He says, but when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. And that word commendable, folks, there in the original language, has, it's kind of two-part. It means grace and favor. God gives you the grace to get through difficult situations. Amen? He gives us that. And then when we're living that kind of life, he gives us favor. And he does favors for us. Amen? Now, i got to say this, because any time I think, when I run across this word favor, 
I think about <clears throat> uh, some of the health and wealth preachers of today. You've, everybody, and you've heard me say this, and what they teach and preach is that if you're not wealthy and you're not healthy, it must be because of sin uh, that, that you have in your life. I heard one preacher on the radio, just not the whole sermon, but just part of it this week, and he's one of those kind of guys. And he told everybody, you're going to have a great year this year. <laughs> God's giving you favor this year and everything. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna have some great things to talk about when this year's over and during this year. You're going to have great things happen. And I'm sitting there in my car thinking, there's probably maybe 100% of the people you're talking to, if they'll be honest, everything that's going to happen to them this year is not going to be great. Amen? We just finished 2018. Everything that happened to me in 2018, it wasn't all great. Some things were, but some things weren't so great. I tell people all the time, how many people here today would consider yourself a senior adult? It doesn't have to be a certain age, okay? Several of us, okay? And we talk, <laughs> we have talked about for years, we're, we're, before we got there, man, I can't wait to get in those golden years. <laughs> now, what, the only thing I can say about these golden years, being golden, is that every year I get closer to home. <laughs> Amen? And, and when I get there, I'll be walking on streets of gold. <laughs> Amen? That's about the only gold I can get out of the golden years. Right? Stand with me, please. We're going to sing God's invitation this morning. Brother Bill, what are we singing? Number 320 will be the invitation this morning. And uh, if God has spoken to your heart and speaks to your heart during this, uh, during this invitation, uh, let me say this, folks. In our Sunday school class this morning, as other Sunday school classes, talked about, about worship and talked about commitment to worship and then being committed to worship when we're in worship. And then really when we leave, the results, how God changes our lives uh, through worship, I mentioned the fact that I, when I was a teenager, I was the world's greatest dr daydreamer, and I found out I had some company, <laughs> some others that, that agreed they did the same thing, but you know what I always noticed, and looking back, I may have sat there and I daydreamed what I was going to be when I got grown up, and I was going to do all these things, and boy, I had all kinds of horses and everything else, but when it came time for the invitation and I stood to my feet and we sang a song of invitation, then all of a sudden I realized, hey, God is speaking to me. Thanks, Darlene. <laughs> so today, what, is it, what are we singing? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. So do that and ask the Lord if there's anything that he wants you to do today. If you've never trusted Jesus, trust him. You can sing.